Um, and that's one of the conditions under which we do this because we are completely open uh, source consortium and we operate in a completely open manner. The other two things we have to say, one is of course the um, code of conduct, which says that we are uh, bound by the code of conduct, which says that uh, you can disagree with people, but do not be disagreeable when doing so and do not hog the floor and do not, um, you know, denigrate people. Uh, the details can be found in the uh, wiki page. The other is of course the antitrust provisions such as they are right now, uh, which uh, basically prevents price collusion between um, companies participating in such fora. And that's about it. And obviously, Bancor is well known to everybody. And uh, Mark is going to talk about, as he announced, the institutionalization of AMM, which is on everybody's uh, lips, both from a regulatory standpoint, as well as from a disruptor standpoint, in the sense that the when will the disruptors become disrupted themselves or when will the disruptors join the mainstream and start taking advantage of all of us? So with that, I uh, yield the floor to Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pippin. Um, I have a, a presentation, uh, so I'm going to share my screen right now, if that's okay. Can everybody uh, see the title slide? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Yes. Okay. So, uh, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, yeah, my name is Mark Richardson. I'm the head of research at, at Bancor. Um, just a little bit about myself. I was actually a, a research scientist for, for 14 years. My, uh, my field was actually organic synthesis. So I didn't come from a traditional economics or financial background. Um, I was mostly in uh, sort of synthetic uh, pharmaceutical compounds, um, nanostructures and other nanomaterials, um, total synthesis, that sort of thing. Um, it was only during the, uh, the pandemic in 2020 um, that my uh, career was, was pretty thoroughly disrupted. I was, I was supposed to uh, visit Berlin and complete a, uh, about a year of work at the um, Max Planck Institute for, for um, Colloids and Surfaces in, in Potsdam. Um, and so when that didn't happen, it wiped out, um, you know, in some about about two years of work and um, caused one of my research grants to become rescinded. And so I immediately started finding um, other ways to, to spend my time. Um, I became uh, extremely interested in, in blockchain technologies and in particular DeFi, which I thought had the best product fit for, uh, for blockchain in general. Um, and this was during the, the 2020 DeFi summer period. Um, I was researching and becoming an active community member in a bunch of different DeFi protocols, including Uniswap. Um, I was there for the SushiSwap vampire attack, which was an extremely interesting time. Um, I was really interested in, in Kaiba network, um, but eventually I kind of settled down on, on Bancor because of the, the types of conversations that were ha happening in that community were very different from um, what was happening everywhere else. It was a lot more fundamentals based. It was, um, I, I thought, much more collaborative and much less, um, you know, much less, let's say toxic, I think is one of the, the ways that I would describe some of the, the stuff that's happening in cryptocurrency. Um, and so as a community member there, I um, started to uh, help guide the, um, the establishment of the bank or DAO. And then, um, you know, within a, a few months, I was collaborating with some of the bank or founders on, on new financial products. Um, including an interest-free um, loan system that we call the Bank of Vortex. And uh, shortly after that, um, the Bank of Foundation reached out to me with a, an offer for full-time employment. And seeing as the pandemic in Australia is still ongoing, and I'm 
um, the, the borders have not yet opened up. Um, so even if I had my uh, my funding from the German government, still I still wouldn't be able to go. So I decided that I, I, I should really just uh, do a hard pivot into, into DeFi. And so what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today is where I sort of see uh, Bancor's competitive advantage with, when it comes to uh, institutional level um, product offerings, but also sort of the lie of the land and also a, a general introduction to, to not just Bancor, but AMS in general. Um, but I'm, oh, I'm happy to let uh, Kurti uh, sort of moderate this. Um, if, if you feel like you want to uh, ask a question as we go, uh, please feel free to just interrupt me. The, the, this presentation is kind of a, a, an amalgamation of a, a couple of different presentations that I had. And so it, it is a little on the long side and I apologize for that in advance. So if you need to interrupt me, please feel free to just interrupt me. So when I ask uh, Kurti what the, uh, the assumed knowledge should be for this audience. Um, he said, oh, somewhere on a, a range of one to 10, I should assume a three or four in terms of expertise in, in AMM technology. So with that in mind, I have uh, prepared a couple of introductory slides featuring uh, you know, familiar faces, characters from The Simpsons and that sort of thing. But this is, this is Martin, my, my favorite character from The Simpsons. And we're gonna assume that he is a, a DeFi native Okay, there are two uh, cryptocurrency tokens that he wants to uh, participate in DeFi with. And in general, um, there are sort of only a couple of different uh, primitives that, that are available, although the, the space is advancing quickly and there is becoming more and more sophisticated uh, ways of, of uh, participating and, and earning money. Um, but providing liquidity and, and making markets is, is still um, one of the most profitable and, and certainly one of the most popular. And so in order to make a market with an automatic market maker, it is fair to assume that the status quo is that you need to provide at least two tokens, although uh, protocols such as Balancer um, allows for, for multi-token uh, bonding curves and other things. Um, so when you are providing liquidity, it's important to realize that you need to combine your tokens in an appropriate ratio. And that, that ratio um, is determined by their price that you know you might be able to uh, to fetch for these tokens on on secondary markets like like Coinbase. So if Martin was to provide uh, liquidity with both of these tokens, he would need to um, create a a set of them such that however many of token A that he is uh, providing liquidity with is equal in value to the number of B tokens that he's providing liquidity with. So in this case, if A is $64, you could provide 125 of those and then 80 of token B that's worth $100 so that both piles are worth 8,000, okay? So that first row, again, is the single token price. That second row is the total number of tokens that he's providing liquidity with. And then that last row is just the, the token values. So if this was Martin's liquidity position, you could say that it's worth $16,000. So just... Um, to think about what, what Martin would actually be doing these things if he wants to participate in an automatic uh, market making system is he would be providing that to a smart contract or a series of smart contracts that we call a liquidity pool. Okay, so you may have heard that, that term before. It's actually been around since our ICO in, in 2017 when we introduced the term, um, but the, um, the pro rata uh, share represent, uh, representation that, that Martin receives has changed its name a couple of times. It used to be called a relay token and then it was called a smart token and now we just call it a, a pool token. So what's important to, to realize about liquidity pools is that while Martin and the rest of us will know the price of these tokens, the liquidity pool has no idea. It doesn't even know what price is really. Um, it only knows how many tokens there are in the pool and that will tell it how it should balance them when it's performing in an exchange. So price is, is an abstract concept you know, in general, but to a liquidity pool, it's completely obscure. There actually is no price quoting in a liquidity pool. Instead, what we have is what's called a constant function bonding curve. And the, the most basic kind is what we call the, the constant product model where the number of tokens contained inside the pool uh, multiplied together is always going to be equal to some unchanging number. So in this case, I chose the numbers 125 and 80 so that that constant is some easy number to remember like 10,000. 
So uh, if Martin provides liquidity with these uh, tokens, he can then start making markets with them. And this is completely passive. It's not something that he has to actively manage. It's not something that's overseen. Uh, it's just automatically executed by the, by the blockchain, and in, in this case, the, um, the Ethereum virtual machine. So if we have a trader who is interested in exchanging um, between the tokens that Martin has provided liquidity with, for example, uh, selling B tokens in this case and purchasing A tokens, the liquidity pool's bonding curve will determine exactly what rate of exchange the trader is going to enjoy. So we can imagine a situation where our trader wants to purchase 10 A tokens. And so the question is, how many B tokens is she parting with? This is relatively simple algebra to solve. We know that by the end of this process, the uh, pool will have uh, depleted by 10 of the A tokens, because this is what the trader is taking away. And then um, the unknown quantity is just how many B tokens is she providing? We know that at the end of this process, it still has to be equal to 10,000. And so it's a relatively simple uh, rearrangement to calculate what this number is, and then compare that to the starting condition. So if it's going to be 86.9 at the end of the transaction and it was 80 at the beginning, then we can tell that it was 6.9 tokens that were sold. So that's the end of that calculation and that's exactly what the, the smart contracts are actually doing. So the, um, the trader in this case would be providing those 6.9 tokens and then receiving 10 A tokens from the pool. And so this would be what we consider to be a fair trade, okay? This means that the, um, the constant product formula is being perfectly obeyed, but it also means that Martin is not receiving any, um, any value from this transaction, right? He's basically just losing, um, losing A tokens and gaining B tokens. And this is uh, especially important if the A token is gaining value and the B token is losing value on secondary markets, then this might not necessarily be a transaction that Martin is always comfortable making. And so we need to make sure that there is, Martin has some incentive to, to participate in, in these kinds of uh, smart contracts. And so we make sure that it's not a perfectly fair trade, that on top of whatever is required to satisfy that constant product, that the uh, trader also pays a commission or what's become known in the industry as, as a pool fee. And it's generally somewhere in that 0.1 to 1% range for that transaction. And so if there are a very large number of transactions happening on that pool, then uh, Martin's passive revenue can actually be uh, quite high. Um, numbers in the sort of 25 to 40% ranges is not unheard of. And that's partially because of the, the lack of um, intermediaries, right? Because you're dealing exclusively with um, the, the trader who's trading with you directly. Um, there isn't these um, you know, middlemen that are siphoning uh, value outside of that system. And I think that that's what blockchains in general are very good at is connecting the value provided directly to the customer. Okay. So um, that's kind of the, the general two token constant product AMM. The Bancor is slightly different in that you cannot use any two tokens that you want. Uh, one of the tokens has to be the, the BNT token. Now, at first that might seem a little jarring, like um, that could be an inconvenience that liquidity providers need to purchase the BNT token, but I'm gonna show you in just a, a couple of slides that this um, one, it, it provides a, a huge benefit to the network overall in the sense that there is always a common um, exchange base token. Um, but two, um, with the release of Banco of version 2.1, uh, it's actually no longer required that all liquidity providers personally have to own BNT, just that all pools have to own it. Okay, so why have BNT or why have the requirement for BNT in all pools? In the case that we saw where they, we had a trader just swapping between A and B, that's fine if we know that that's the only market that's going to exist for, for example, the A token. But imagine now that we're in a, a more complicated system where there might be a bunch of different tokens. Imagine then that the trader wants to swap the A token now instead of for B tokens, but for C tokens. As long as BNT is in every single pool, then you can always uh, perform a trade between any two assets via that BNT as, as a conduit, right? As an intermediate transaction. So the swap from A to C would occur first from A to BNT, 
and then B and T to the C token. And this is true no matter how many pools are a part of the system. So now, you know, Bancor protocol currently has something like 200 pools in it. Um, and you can swap then between any of these tokens um, using BNT as the, uh, the intermediate exchange. And so BNT kind of becomes uh, a utility token, right? It's the, it's the thing that actually powers the, the Bancor network. And its tokenomics was developed under the, um, you know, uh, with explicit guidance from FINMA um, so that we can continue to classify BNT as a non-security. And this has a, a huge amount of um, advantages as we move into, you know, what I think a lot of protocols in DeFi for them is kind of uncharted waters. Um, but, you know, Bancor is a, a slightly older protocol and we've been very smart about um, how, um, how the protocol and its tokens were developed such that we're not sort of encroaching on anything that would be, um, that would cause us regulatory stress. Um, so that, I, I just wanted to point that out, that in terms of institutional adoption, BNT is actually already in a really good position. Um, and within the, um, within Switzerland, we already have a, a collection of private banks that allow BNT to be bought and traded directly from um, their customers' internet banking user interface. And uh, you can actually um, stake uh, BNT in the Bancor protocol from these internet banking interfaces. Right, so it was kind of built with, with institutional adoption in mind. Okay, so um, to understand sort of, um, you know, what some of the, the more significant changes in, in the Bancor ecosystem have been, the first thing that we have to do is go back to April of 2020 with the launch of Bancor version two. Because while AMMs are really great, um, and you know, I, I do think that they are disrupting uh, a lot of the traditional, um, you know, sophisticated professional market maker space. Um, they're they're far from perfect, and we kind of identified um, back when we first uh, announced version two was being released what the, the four major pain points are with AMM design currently, um, and two of them. Uh, the most prominent two are certainly the uh, what, what we call impermanent loss, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit about what impermanent loss is shortly, um, and the, the requirement to maintain exposure to multiple assets. So as I said before, it is inconvenient to ask liquidity providers to purchase some amount of BNT in order to support their liquidity, it, especially when we're dealing with other token teams who, as a, for now, let's call them a stand-in for institutions. Um, they often either have some limitation acting on them where they actually can't purchase BNT for some reason, or they can't sell you know, half their token treasury to buy BNT. They would rather just use the tokens that they have. Um, this is also true with um, you know, some uh, existing uh, DeFi, uh, well, sort of CDFI applications that are built on top of Bancor, such as uh, Celsius. Uh, they use the Bancor pools to provide liquidity and earn yields for their, uh, for their customers, but also crypto.com uses the Bancor protocol in order to earn its yield. And so um, in both of those cases for Celsius and for, for crypto.com, they can only use the, the, the tokens that their customers have provided them with, right? And they uh, can't sort of behind the scenes start swapping out uh, customers' funds for, for other tokens that the, their customers didn't want to be exposed to. And so the ability to, um, to provide liquidity with just one token without having to exchange it for something else and provide liquidity with both is something that we, we thought was a huge bottleneck and something that absolutely had to be resolved before uh, institutions would start taking it seriously. Um, the, the last two I'm gonna talk about a little bit later in the presentation, this is capital and efficiency. And uh, this has become something of a meme, I would say over the last six months. Um, especially with the launch of things like Curve V2 and Uniswap V3. Um, but again, we'll, we'll talk about that shortly. And then the opportunity cost of providing liquidity as well. Okay, so let's talk about Bancor version two, which is um, a now uh, retired version of, of the protocol. It was developed exclusively to deal with impermanent loss and capital eff efficiency using the same mechanism. And so if you consider this hyperbolic curve, this is the constant product bonding curve and, and the same thing that Bancor was using 
back in 2017 to to perform uh, you know um, to perform exchanges between any two tokens. The problem is is that when you're trading on any part of it, all of the other parts of the curve aren't being used. So if you're providing, for example, a million dollars in liquidity to one of these things, it could be that no trade is actually using any more than ten thousand dollars worth of it. And so that means the other nine hundred ninety thousand dollars of, of liquidity is effectively um, idle, right? And it could be put to better use somewhere else. And so that's the capital inefficiency problem. What we decided to do was to essentially artificially, mathematically, synthetically um, blow up that, uh, that hyperbola such that it no longer was contained within the X and the Y axis, and then allow this curve to sort of move around under the influence of a chain link price oracle. So we call this uh, liquidity amplification. We're using 20X, um, but this is the same idea that has gone into curve V2 and, and Uniswap V3. So how this worked, was essentially as traders would start moving one of the assets um, away from peg, um, this would essentially cause the, the pool to become imbalanced or you can treat it as becoming imbalanced. The chain link price oracle would then sort of detect that imbalance and then move this fulcrum, if you like, in order to bring the liquidity back into range. And this was a dynamic process. It happened in, in every block. So as traders continued to move the liquidity in and out of the curve, uh, the chain link price oracle would continue to keep the, the liquidity in range. And so this is 100% automatic. Every, every block, this was being updated. And so what this was good for was one, it was, it was extremely capital efficient. And two, it also protected liquidity providers against impermanent loss because the pool is always trading at exactly the, the market rate, right? Or exactly the rate that you're getting on Coinbase or, or um, Binance or anything else. So why did we have to retire this model? Okay, it's, it's a, a, an important point. And I think that it's something that um, a lot of our competitors have, have neglected to study because the, the same flaw that we had is also um, contained inside some of, the, uh, some of their product offerings at present. If you think about uh, how these kinds of strategies would be implemented, right? Ours was completely automatic, um, but there are several sort of manual strategies that are being developed now with, um, you know, yield aggregators and, and other sophisticated um, intermediaries that are trying to use products like Uniswap v3 for precisely what we were trying to do with, with Bancor version 2. But you, you're basically always looking at the present block, right? There, there's the mempool and a certain number of transactions that are going to be included um, in, in whatever block is about to be mined. And you are using basically the, the past data to influence that, that decision, okay? So if the, for example, if the liquidity is moving out of range, it's only moving out of range with reference to the past. The problem is that arbitrageurs and miners, they don't just, um, they can't just look at the future, they can determine it. So if the liquidity is moving out of range, um, you might think that they have an incentive, for example, to, to rebalance it um, or, you know, perform an arbitrage trade um, in order to extract, you know, a small amount of value from the pool. But what we found was that you actually provide them with an, an alternative um, way to extract even more value. And that's to throw the, the pool even further off kilt in order to force the, uh, the Oracle to rebalance the liquidity in such a way that you can then perform a, a second transaction at the, at the end after the rebalancing that causes even more of a, an arbitrage incentive at the end. So really it's the adversarial nature of, of Ethereum that meant that this, this model was, was pretty unsustainable. And I'm gonna show you some data later on in the, uh, in the presentation that su strongly suggests that this is happening um, on, on, some of, um, on some of our competitors' products right now. So um, we had to retire version two and we immediately followed it up with uh, version 2.1. So during that version two, let's call it an experiment, we had a, a lot of opportunity to uh, discuss with, um, you know, with both our community and also, you know, these kinds of these braver sort of institutional influences. Um, some of the, you know, the market makers on, on Coinbase, for example, we, we were in close touch with them. We were talking to um, people that were running sophisticated arbitrage bots and, and things. And, you know, DeFi was really starting to find its legs. 
And so when we asked, what was the most important thing about version two to you, right? What was the, what's the one feature that you wouldn't want to part with if we had to move to a different protocol? By and large, it was the impermanent loss. A lot of the, um, a lot of the people that are, uh, have become assimilated into the Bangkok community are the ones that have been, um, you know, taken advantage of, or at least they feel they've been taken advantage of on some of the more traditional AMM protocols like, like Uniswap version two and SushiSwap. And also, you know, Bangkok version one, right? We, we invented the AMM and so we kind of invented IL at the same time. And so this was really the, um, the feature that we felt that we had to maintain, um, especially when we're talking to institutions because they kind of want the assurance that if they're providing money to, to the protocol, that they can, um, that they, they have no risk of leaving with less money than they provided. It also struck a chord with the Chainlink community, okay? And I think that, you know, the way that they have um, flocked to, to, to Bancor and the, the value that they see in, in what Bancor is doing, um, it also is, it has direct parallels with the kinds of institutions that we're also speaking to. So for example, it's kind of a meme that we're gonna make it means that um, the Chainlink community members in general have uh, absolute conviction that the token that they have chosen will be the thing that outperforms the market. Okay, so they don't want to entertain the idea that they should sell part of their, their Chainlink to buy something else in order to provide liquidity with it. Um, to the idea of that is, is, you know, disgusting to them. And then the other thing is that they, you know, um, they had a strong desire to have as much of that token as possible, right? That it's, it's not just a, a trading game for them. Um, it, it's much more about sort of that wealth accrual, that long-term, um, accumulation of, of a certain asset. So in traditional uh, liquidity protocols, uh, you can't really do either of those things, right? You actually are asking people that they have to either hold less of the asset that they prefer or sell some of it in order to buy something else to provide liquidity with that. And on Bancor, we say that actually you can just provide the one token. I'll explain how that works right now. So remember I said that um, on Bancor, we have BNT as being the base token in all of the pools. That's still true, um, but it no longer has to be provided by the same liquidity provider. So you can have a second person who is extremely enthusiastic about one particular token, and they can enter effectively into a partnership with the BNT token holder. And so this is advantageous because that means that uh, Tony, in this case, um, he gets to maintain 100% exposure to the asset that he wanted, just like the Chainlink community wants to. Um, whereas the BNT holder, they get to speculate on what uh, assets are going to have the highest velocity, which things are going to have the, the biggest trading volumes. And it's usually the case, you know, volatility is itself volatile, right? And, you know, AMMs are kind of anti-fragile in the sense that you want to have your tokens in the pool that has the, the highest volatility, because that means it's, it's processing the largest trade volumes and it's collecting the largest commissions. So it's not necessarily the, the case that you want to be in a pool that, with something that just has you know, uh, a highly valued asset or something. You want to be in a pool that has a, a, lot, of, um, you know, a lot of trading volume associated with it, because that means that your profits are, are, are highest. And so this relationship means that as a BNT holder, you now get the flexibility to move your BNT around in order to extract the most value from anywhere in the protocol where, uh, where you find it. Um, but it also means that um, the other side of the pool, the, the, the token um, provider, um, has the, uh, the freedom from having to, to sell some of their tokens or, um, or hold less tokens than they would otherwise like to. So I'd say that this is a, a commensal relationship or a, uh, you know, a, a collaboration. And that's one of the things that I, I really appreciate about Bancor. So um, it's not always the case though, that there are enough BNT uh, community members in order to support all of the Tonys of the world. Um, you know, I, we've got something like a, a third of a billion dollars just in chain link liquidity right now, um, about the same amount in Ethereum. 
there just isn't enough uh, B and T in the in the world in order to support that. And so we needed to make sure that there was a, a way around that. What we developed was a system where the BNT supply becomes elastic and where the protocol can supply its own BNT. And so this is BNT that is minted out of nothingness. So it's, it's an inflationary aspect of the protocol. Um, and then that BNT is then contributed alongside uh, Tony's uh, tokens. What's interesting about this is that it means that the protocol is earning its own revenue. Of course, the minting of new tokens, uh, it, it does bring an inflationary element to, to our tokenomics. And so there have to be uh, deflationary mechanisms in place to counteract it. And in this case, uh, one of the, or, you know, the, the, most pronounced, um, uh, the most pronounced deflationary effect comes into, a, a, comes into play when Tony removes his tokens from the protocol. So as Tony is removing the A token, the protocol then removes its BNT and destroys it, right? So the, the, the BNT was created just for this liquidity provision event, and then it's destroyed at the end. However, even though the minted BNT is destroyed, all of the re BNT revenue that was generated, which is BNT that is kind of sucked in from external markets um, over the course of the trading, the protocol gets to keep that. And so it's an interesting question then. If the protocol is earning all of this money, and it's earning a lot of money now, right? It, the protocol is now the largest BNT holder in the world. What is it going to spend its money on, right? This is value that it has actually you know, accrued for itself. And this doesn't go into a community treasury. Um, this isn't something, you know, the, the, the Bancor protocol is, is completely funded out of its ICO. Um, we've established a, a Swiss nonprofit that, that, you know, keeps the lights on, pays for the legal fees and uh, pays for development. So the, the protocol isn't, doesn't actually need money in order to support itself. And so the question of what it's going to spend its money on is, is extremely important. And I, I will be coming back to it very shortly. To understand what it spends its money on, first we need to think about what happens when the people that aren't uh, a part of the bank or protocol are providing uh, liquidity elsewhere in the ecosystem. So for example, the, the meme is that uh, Chainlink is, is usually outperforming everything else, which means that you are kind of in an option straddle between the two tokens that you're providing liquidity with. And so as your Chainlink in this case is, is um, moving up versus the other token you provided liquidity with, you're actually selling that chain link off um, automatically, but through the, an arbitrage process and accumulating the other thing. Um, and so this is why we say, you know, it, impermanent loss results in broken hearts, because in general, when people are providing liquidity, it's with the uh, intention to accumulate more of that particular token. And so as that token starts to outperform the market, they end up with less of it. And so as a token project, for example, you are kind of asking your most devout followers to sort of short their own token in the sense that they uh, are going to end up with less of it, or, or um, you know, they, they are going to want to um, in order to be the most profitable, pair it with another token that is likely to perform as well as the thing that they're providing liquidity with. And so this results in um, these kinds of charts where you can see the collected fees is this blue line, um, but the actual potential losses of these are red and, and green lines. And so often, you know, especially in the retail space, uh, people don't actually I don't think they realize precisely what kind of losses they're making, but it's a lot of effort to go to to make less money than doing nothing, right? That's what these charts are being compared to. Okay, so on Bancor, because we offer the single, single asset exposure, you actually get to keep 100% exposure to just that asset. And so on Bancor, um, the relative profits are this orange line. And so this, this difference, right, this chasm, is it's not insignificant. It's like a 10 to 15% difference between providing liquidity on, on Bancor versus anyone else. And that single uh, data point, and so this is real data, by the way, this is, uh, I think I scraped this from some sushi swap, but it could have come from any of the, um, any of the major AMMs out there. Um, this one feature is why one of the largest uh, cryptocurrency market makers that in the world 
actually provides liquidity on Bancor, but arbitrages Uniswap, right? So they don't actually trade where they provide liquidity because they don't want to be exposed to this type of effect. Okay, so let's understand where that comes from, right? Why is it possible to lose money? Because it doesn't seem like that should be true. Remember that we set up this situation with Martin where he's providing 125 of the A token, 80 of the B token. And that was because they were both worth $8,000. So the question is, what happens if one of those tokens changes its price immediately after um, Martin can, commits it to the liquidity pool? So let's say that, you know, and this isn't outlandish at all, let's say that the A, the A token doubles in price, right? Immediately after Martin provides liquidity with it. That this happens, you know, that's just a regular Tuesday for cryptocurrency, it seems. So now we're at $128 per, per A token, but the number of tokens that Martin provided hasn't changed, it's still at 125. So now to Martin's mind, he's provided $16,000 of A, and $8,000 of B. And so that means a total of $24,000 of, of value he's contributed to the pool. But remember, the pool doesn't know what prices are. All it knows is how many of each token there are and that they're, um, the numbers multiplied together has to be equal to some constant, right? Which in, in the example that we, uh, we looked at before was 10,000. So the only conclusion is, that Martin is going to start selling the token that is moving up in price at a, at a pretty profound discount until um, the, the position on the bonding curve starts to match what the, uh, the secondary, market, secondary markets are quoting for A. So I'm going to skip over some of the math because it, it's a lot less trivial than um, some of the other things we've been looking at here. But if, if you want to ask me about it later, please, please feel free to contact me. I can show you how to do it. But essentially, there's going to be a different kind of market participant now who is going to try and extract more value from Martin than he meant to part with. And so if the A token is going up in value, this is the one that you're going to be buying. And um, you're going to be selling the thing that either isn't moving or is moving down. So Nelson, in this case, is going to be the, the person who's performing this uh, process. And he's going to sell, I think, 33, yeah, 33.17 B tokens. And he's going to buy uh, 36 uh, A tokens. And so if we apply those to Martin's apparent balances, you can see that Martin is ending up with $11,000 on each side for a total of about $22,600, which is less than the $24,000 that he thought that he had. And so this difference of $1,000 is what we call impermanent loss. It's called impermanent because if the price ever comes back the other way, then Nelson will actually sell those tokens that he took back into the pool to bring it back into balance again. Um, so it, it's, it's called impermanent because he might not have lost this money forever, but more often than not, it's lost forever. He also made a little bit of fees though. As Nelson performed this trade, Nelson still had to pay, um, still had to pay the, the commission or the pool fee. But this $33 is, is pretty pale in comparison to the $1,300 that the Martin's losing. So this is an arbitrage cost and it's completely inescapable. Um, it's not, you know, it's easy to think that Nelson is doing something wrong here, but just like arbitrage in, in traditional finance, there's, there's nothing fundamentally wrong about it. In a, in a sense, it actually keeps the market healthy. It means that Martin's liquidity pool is always um, buying and selling assets at a rate that is commensurate with what you would expect to get on, on Coinbase or, or Binance or something like that. So remember this question of what is the protocol going to spend its money on? And it's making a lot of money is it uses it uh, after it's calculated what um, Martin's impermanent loss is, it then uses that money to refund Martin. So Martin is not exposed to impermanent loss when he's providing liquidity on Bancor. And it means that at the time that he withdraws, the protocol basically uh, sections off funds and gives it back to the liquidity provider so that they get the, the, the full exposure that they were, uh, they were expecting. And yeah, this is the this is the thing that we have found has really struck a, a chord with uh, with institutional players. So is it some sort of an insurance product? Yeah. So yeah, being Bancor is an insurance product. It is both. <laughs> it's currently both a, a Dex and an insurance company, um, and okay. we're hoping to to grow that kind of um, that that kind of synergy even further. So that was Bancor versions. 
2 and 2.1. Um, and we have just recently announced that we're developing uh, version 3. And so this is really not too far away now. Our community is going completely nuts, uh, waiting for us to, to reveal more about it. Um, but this is really not too far off. Um, I think we're, um, we're ex I have said previously that I will be very sad if it doesn't hit um, by the end of this year. Um, but we still haven't actually released a, uh, an official uh, date yet. So if you come back to thinking about what were our mission statements with, with version two, right? That the super, um, the super optimistic, highly automated, academically, you know, beautiful thing that, that it was, but was, you know, unfortunately highly exploitable. We've still managed to strike off those first two important points, right? The exposure to impermanent loss is now no longer uh, something that we have to contend with. And exposure to multiple assets is something we no longer have to contend with. So it's really these ideas of capital efficiency and the opportunity cost of, of providing liquidity on a DEX that are sort of the remaining known problems of an AMF. I wanna quickly explore this idea of capital efficiency because I, I hope um, you know, some of the, the, the listeners are at least familiar with the idea that what Uniswap V3 brought to the table was you know, a capital efficient AMM product, right? And even though I, it, it is slightly derivative of what we had with version two, it is sufficiently different and it's very interesting in the way that it is, um, it is implemented and it's extremely popular. Something like 85% of the, the trade volume on Ethereum right now is being routed through Uniswap V3. So in terms of attracting huge volumes, it has certainly done that, but that doesn't mean that it's a successful DEX. In order to demonstrate this, um, you know, you can take a screenshot right now if you want to uh, prove this for, your, for yourself on an Excel or something like that. That when you are providing uh, this kind of liquidity amplification, or what, or what Uniswap is calling concentrated liquidity, you can think of it as basically uh, moving this amplification factor up. So when you've got an amplification factor of one, you've got the the standard um, the standard hyperbola, and then as you move it up through two or three or whatever. Um, this is the amount that that hyperbola is growing. You can think of it as like a magnification. And so that means that traders who are trading on this curve now, the price impact of their trade is, is diminished. So they get slightly better prices compared to the, the standard hyperbola. But that is also the proportion of the slippage or the effective slippage paid by the liquidity provider. So there's, there is no free lunch, right? If there is a lesser price impact, it means that the liquidity provider is giving up more tokens for a, less, a lesser cost. And I think that this is something that has gone a little bit by the wayside, mostly due to some very clever marketing by the Uniswap team and you know, all the more power to them. Um, but it is something that has kept, I think, institutions from actually becoming genuinely uh, or sincerely interested in, in using it for anything except trading. So the question is, when they talk about capital efficiency, efficient for whom? And I have a, an example that I, I want to show you. It has been cherry picked because it, you know, it is an extreme case, but I want to uh, demonstrate just how severe this problem is and why I want you to be confident when I say um, that the, the institutions that I'm speaking with are, um, are, are really not interested in using products like Uniswap. So you can verify this if you like on chain. Um, this is a uh, AXS uh, wrapped ETH um, NFT. So this is a, a liquidity position that was created on Uniswap V3. And this is the transaction hash. So again, if you want to screenshot right now and verify this for yourself, you're welcome to. Or if not, just contact me after the, the presentation. I can share these details with you. So this position, um, it was $200,000 uh, $200, around about, and it currently has about $64,000 worth of unclaimed fees. And this position is uh, 123 days old. So a very quick back of the envelope calculation shows that this is about a 32% uh, gain in only 123 days. So that's about what, almost 90% uh, over a year, which seems 
really, really great, given the information that Uniswap actually provides you with. However, if you actually investigate on chain at how much money was provided, you can see that it's almost $700,000 worth of, of tokens. So it's not a 30% gain in 123 days, it's actually a 60% loss over that time period. And so this kind of leakage from, from that position um, is catastrophic. Like, I, I don't think that this is trivial and I don't think institutions do either. And so if we're developing an institutional grade product, something that is appropriate for pension funds, something that is going to be, you know, that people are gonna put their savings in, I don't think this level of risk is acceptable. And I also, uh, you know, we've got a research paper coming out about this um, in, the, in the coming weeks, so please stay tuned. Um, but it looks like even the professionals are also really bad at making money on Uniswap. So there are people that are um, providing liquidity and removing liquidity in, in a single block. And those tend to be, um, you know, for extremely specific purposes. And I think that those types of sophisticated players will continue to operate that way, but it's highly exploitative. In order to perform these kinds of activities, it actually requires that someone is providing liquidity beneath you. And you are basically uh, coming in just as a profitable trade is occurring and then collecting all of the fees for yourself. So it's, it's not a retail game and employing someone in order to, you know, uh, perform these strategies for you is not the kind of it's 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 kind of the antithesis of what DeFi was invented for. It's meant to be very self-driving, highly efficient by itself, without having to um, without having to have uh, an extremely uh, well-educated, highly sophisticated individual responsible for managing it. Right. The the whole idea was to get rid of of incumbency and and middlemen. So. Yeah, the, the, the capital efficiency argument, I'm just gonna say is, is the jury is still out. I don't think that what's presented on this slide suggests that um, amplifying the liquidity on the curve is necessarily a good, uh, a good approach to becoming more capital efficient. In short, institutions want assurances and so do I, right? This is something that is applicable, not just to the, you know, to, to private banks and um, you know, family funds and things, but also the retail space. There are people with nine to five jobs that don't have the time or the patience or the knowledge to manage liquidity in the same way these sophisticated individuals are on V3. And so I think that um, it's a much bigger market um, to provide uh, a product that lazy liquidity providers, the uneducated liquidity providers can participate in. So yeah, capital efficiency, let's say that this is still an unresolved issue. And um, I think that there are better ways to, to handle it. So Dan Alitza published a, a blog post in, in February of 2019, talking about what he called superfluid collateral. And um, I actually agree with almost every single thing in this blog post. I, I, I highly recommend that you go in and read it, but I'll just skip to sort of the end um where he's basically saying that this idea that you can use tokens for more than one thing simultaneously is a a much better way to think about um the the type of breakthrough that DeFi is about to make so not the idea that necessarily that you can provide liquidity for trading with a token or stake it for something else or perform you know, uh, lending and, and borrowing with it. But the idea that you could have a, a single protocol, a single program that can do all of these things simultaneously is a much better way to think about it. And this kind of, it flies a little bit in the face of the DeFi Legos uh, paradigm that we're currently living in. But you can see with announcements like, um, like SushiSwap's Trident and what Trader Joe is doing now on Avalanche that um, I think most of the, the DeFi teams um, they're all kind of thinking the same thing and they all want to offer the full, the full suite of services um, that modern banks offer their customers. Mark, uh, conscious of time, do you think we can take a few questions from the audience? And... Yeah, of course. Let's, um, I can end it there, actually. If you like. Yeah, let's end it there. Okay. okay. Uh, I'll just skip to the end.
But yeah, let's go ahead. And I'll, I'll go ahead and take um, take questions there as I load up my um, my contact information. Brilliant. Will you be sharing those slides with us? Yeah, of course. If you want. Them. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah. Um. So uh, Manny has come up with a question asking about liquidity staking. Uh, can you quickly explain or describe liquidity staking? Yeah, for sure. So there's when we talk about staking there's really um two different um it, it can mean two different things depending on the context if you stake for example ethereum in a, a liquidity pool what you're doing is basically allowing that liquidity pool to perform that constant function market making process with them but when you provide those ethereum uh to the pool it will usually issue you some receipt, right? And we, we call those pool tokens. And those pool tokens basically represent a, a pro rata share of everything that the pool contains. And so staking in this case, it doesn't necessarily mean, it's not for proof of consensus or something like, um, like ADA is used for on, on Cardano or what the beacon chain is used for on, on Ethereum. In this case, all we mean by staking is committing, um, committing tokens to a smart contract. You can think of staking as being a synonym for, for deposit or something like that. And then the, the other type of staking is what I alluded to just then. Um, and this is uh, a part of the proof of consensus uh, or proof of stake um, consensus mechanism that's currently being investigated and may offer a uh, alternative to proof of work, but uh, not a part of this presentation. So yeah, when I say staking, what I mean is Give, broken, give tokens to a smart contract with the ambition that that smart contract will generate yields for the user. Brilliant. Um, a couple of questions around, um, uh, I've been trying to understand. So all of this is, oh, Ron, go on. Thank you, thank you, Kirithia. And Mark, I just wanna say fantastic presentation, really, really grateful and I really appreciate it. Um, would love to take a conversation with, with you and the others on this team as well. In my old world, back in the institutional days, a lot of what you were discussing in slippage, it falls under a category uh, that we used to talk about around implementation shortfall. Um, right. But one, other, one question I do have also is, uh, it, to the extent you can discuss it, those institutional conversations, um, the other component that they, we, in, in my past, I've often seen that they're concerned about is moving at size. Can you talk right. a little bit about how institutions perceive that in the DEX world, uh, what Bancor is doing to allow them potentially maybe in V3 or beyond to move in size, or is it simply a matter of them spreading across the DEX? Yeah, um, so the, the, the scalability is, is, certainly, um, is certainly an issue. And yes, we, we do have an answer for it in version three. I can't, um, I, I think I'm still under a gag order as, I can't talk about that feature specifically, but just uh, I can tell you that it, it, you're absolutely right. Um, if there's, for example, a, um, a a potential client that says that they want to contribute, you know, a, a billion dollars or something to the pools, uh, that could potentially, you know, double our, our TVL overnight. And you know, they might only want to provide it in, in a single pool, and that would mean that the, the protocol is forced to sort of make markets now with this, this enormous amount of capital. Um, and in general, you get diminishing returns, right? As the pools get deeper and deeper, the ROI actually comes down. And so it's not always the, it's not always the case that a deeper pool means a, a more performant pool. Um, and as the ROI goes down, the exposure to um, that divergence loss, the, the impermanent loss, um, that continues to scale linearly. So the, yeah, the, there is a scalability issue and that uh, I, I encourage you to have a look at that blog entry by Dan Alitza, uh, because I don't think that just using that kind of capital to make markets is going to be the, um, the, the winning strategy for much longer with, with or without liquidity amplification. I think there's going to be, and this is the, the sort of thing that I'm researching in depth, you need to offer a sort of a, a diverse range of different yield generating primitives um, that, are, that support that scalability, right? It can't just be one thing. You don't wanna turn people away when they're bringing that kind of capital to, to a protocol and tell them, oh, you know, you should probably put some of this in, in some of our com you know, competitors' products, or you should probably 
you know, do this, that, or the other thing. You really want to make sure that you've got everything that you need in order to accommodate that level of capital in-house. And, and that's something that we're trying to bring, bring to the table with version three. Thanks, Mark. Re really great presentation. Really well done. Thank you. Thank you very and much. I, Was there, did you have a second? Can I ask you a question? Today? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so let's, let's step back a little bit. Yeah. Basically, what you're talking about is the basic premise, which is a uh, pro constant product, which uh, implies a certain price conversion between one to the other. Yeah. If you if you remember, I don't know whether you're familiar with the U.S. Uh, history of the U.S. economy. There is something called bimetallism, which did the same thing with gold and silver, and right. um, in fact, it was shown to be uh, having most of the things that we have observed here, which is basically one asset moving moving in price with respect to another. Um, so don't you think that that is a, uh, you know, it's a basic problem with this, this philosophy in the sense that all of these methods that you have done to mitigate those effects are in effect because the price between these yeah. two, two assets are. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, tethered. let's come back. Yeah, yeah. So I think one of the, yeah, you're absolutely right. 100%. Um, but the, the problem that we're trying to alleviate is the requirement for a human market maker, right? It's the, the, the it, one of the oldest kinds of white collar crime is to, um, is to front deliberately- run, Do yeah, all kinds of stuff. Front, yeah, not just front running, but deliberately misquoting something, right? Yes. It, the, the, and, and DeFi, blockchains in general, are about trustlessness. And so what the AMM is doing is it, it guarantees that the, the, the price that you receive for something um, is agreed upon by everyone and is not under the influence of anyone. And so that's really the problem that, we're, that is trying to be uh, addressed. But the, 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 specific, um, the specific thing that you've drawn attention to, which is the fact that these, you can have two different things that aren't necessarily, um, that, that are in no way anchored to each other or that, you know, their, their prices aren't derived from each it other. It's dynamic. It, it, That's all I'm saying. It's dynamic, right? Yeah. I'm not true. saying that you cannot yeah, discover yeah. a price at a point, but that yeah. it is, doesn't remain constant. Yeah, correct. Um, but what's interesting is when you start stringing a very large number of these things together. And so uh, with, with the balance of pools, for example, rather than having bonding curves, they have bonding surfaces and those surfaces are highly customizable. So rather than have, um, you know, a, what we call a 50-50 pool, which again, Bancor will, will always have that because it, it gives traders um, the, the best possible slippage. Um, but you, it, at the sacrifice of slippage, you can actually create a, a custom curve that does something else. Now, again, that it, it, it's, it's not addressing the problem that you're raising, but it does diminish it a little bit or at least alleviate it a little bit. Um, but in Bancor's case, when you've got a very large number of these pools, um, you end up with such a, a flexible kind of price discovery vehicle that the price of something, even though it's expressed in terms of BNT on the protocol, the price of BNT and the price of Ethereum and Bitcoin and everything else that we have are always gonna be moving independently of, of each other. And as long as the protocol is large enough, as long as there's enough BNT liquidity there to, to support it, um, it, it doesn't really run into, um, into too many problems. One of the things that I didn't discuss, by the way, is, is exactly how our impermanent loss refund mechanism works in depth. Um, and it means that there's basically, um, by allowing for BNT to, to inflate and deflate, you kind of have this, um, this amazing uh, like value cushion underneath everything. And so even if something is going to, you know, move in price parabolically um, next to BNT and things have, right? We've, had, we've already had the Matic pool, for example, moved 100X um, during a time where BNT only moved, I think, 20X. And so, you know, that, that relative difference, um, it, it should be a problem in the sense that if there was only one liquidity pool for that, that asset pair, um, that, 
you know, it, it would basically throw the whole thing off kilt and the, the market would become dysfunctional. But because the, you know, the BNT bleed off is, is being able to, uh, is being absorbed both from, um, you know, from centralized exchanges and also from other pools in the network, it, it, there's really, uh, it, it's boundless, right? How, how far these, um, these prices can move relative to each other. And I think if, you would, if I was to give this presentation a year ago, you would say that's highly speculative. There's no way that you can, you can say that with confidence. But we've now been through you know, such, a, um, such a turbulent year of, of price discovery, not just for BNT, but for a whole bunch of assets across the network that there's really good reason to think that this, this thing, this idea is very sustainable. Well, um, I mean, beautiful. Uh, the, the, the point um, that I'm trying to make is that when you have these pairs, uh, I mean, some kind of, you know, the pricing uh, exchange rate between two things, um, in the regular markets, in regular times, that yeah. uh, price doesn't move that much. But right. in, in, um, in the uh, cryptocurrency market, that price seems to be highly volatile even during regular times, uh, <laughs> including, including uh, even some of the worst downturns we have seen. But as we know, sometimes when the market moves um, heavily, like for example, the mortgage crisis of 2008, where the price right. of mortgages was undiscoverable. So yeah. <laughs> in, in other words, one price goes to zero, then you know yeah. all bets are off. So in the regular marketplace, there are um, what are called uh, providers of liquidity of last resort. Yeah. Okay? Uh, which which uh, in our case happen to be, let's say central banks, would buy, right. step in to buy stuff when they plunge. Um, uh, so, so, that... Sorry to interrupt you, Vipin. Uh, I, I think conscious of time, I think uh, people from the other groups are coming in. So maybe we should wrap it up and probably invite Mark again for another session. <laughs> so, well, maybe we uh, can just ask him the question, which is uh, basically, yeah. um, you know. What happens when something goes to zero? What happened? Is there an equivalent of a liquidity of last resort uh, provider? Can we um, make one in AMM? Yes, yes, we can. Yeah. In fact, you know, we're already Banco is already at the stage now because the BNT token appreciated in price so quickly um, during 2021 that if every single human liquidity provider was to withdraw from the protocol today, the protocol would still have liquidity left over. And so there is like the protocol will now, it will just maintain some basal level of liquidity across essentially every, every single pool, a couple of exceptions. But yes, the, that liquidity will remain, you know, essentially forever. And let's not forget, and this is going to sound a little macabre, but, you know, take, take with it what you will. Um, during 2020 and 2021, there are probably a whole bunch of liquidity providers who have died, right? And if, you know, because of the, the pandemic or other things, and if their family or lawyer or something didn't have access to their private keys, then that liquidity will remain on the, the bonding curve forever. Um, there are also people that, you know, that lose their private keys or get their wallets hacked or something like that, um, or who, you know, turn their back on cryptocurrency or, or for, for whatever reason, um, decide to leave their liquidity in the protocol and never return for it. Um, and so in a sense, there is this residual, right? Some people call it dust, right? Sometimes when you want to withdraw from a protocol, you, are, you withdraw like 99.999% of it or something because of rounding errors. And so the rest of it kind of remains behind as, as residual. And the Banco protocol, along with every other DEX, has that um, property about it. The other property is gas fees. Generally, when these huge market um, crashes are occurring, the price of doing something with your liquidity is uh, it goes through the roof. And so a lot of people end up, you know, and this is both good and bad, um, but they end up kind of uh, shackled to whatever DeFi application that they've committed to because the price of removing it is, is just astronomical compared to the capital that they've uh, provided. And, you know, for better or for worse, this has a stabilizing effect, not just on the protocol, but on the assets themselves. 
because it means that these panic sellers or would be pa panic sellers um, kind of have this minimum level of friction between withdrawing those assets and then and then selling them back into um, into that death spiral. So I'd say that DEXs in general have actually been um, a, a highly stabilizing influence where we would once have to rely entirely on, uh, on human market makers who, let's face it, are probably getting pretty nervous when they're taking on a, a large amount of exposure to crypto assets as people are selling them off. We've seen 99% you know, drops in, in cryptocurrency pretty regularly. Um, that I think that those market makers, they start to price things a lot lower than they otherwise would because they themselves are panicking. So the DEX space has actually started to even the keel a little bit. Um, and I think that overall, we're, we're headed towards a, a, much more, um, a much more stable ecosystem. And you know, it, cryptocurrency is one of the hardest things to tame. You say that you know, the, the, the crashes of, of when um, mortgages, the price of mortgages become undiscoverable. I promise you, you know, the, the kinds of um, downturns we've seen in cryptocurrency dwarf that. And the fact that DEXs have managed to weather that and come out stronger on the other side, I think is testament to their fortitude. So here, here's where I, I want to call it a wrap, guys. Uh, thanks, thanks, Mark. Um, yeah, my pleasure. So much for for uh, taking the time to explain these things to us. Um, so please reach out to Mark for all your questions. Uh, he's a great guy. Um, so 